Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 301. My early years, dreams, and psychedelics. What happened was, uh, you know, I had uh, was married from uh, from fifty nine to sixty one, and then um, I went east to try to get enlightened or something, and um, met the Tibetans and um, and then became a monk uh, after a little bit back and forth, and then when um, at a certain point in being a monk back in the states in sixty five six. I decided I was going to help Leary because I knew Tim from Harvard before that and Richard and uh, Ralph Metzner and uh, some others in that circle. And uh, so uh, then um, I went to Millbrook to help Tim, I thought, uh, to um, cool out in his struggle with the government in late 65, you know, that he was uh, early 66. And I thought, my plan was to, because I've been, having been doing, been a monk for, and meditating for a few years, I thought they could use meditation and cool down the, the, the acid and everything like that. And so I was going to go and be an instructor at Millbrook of how to meditate without having to take actual psychedelic, because they knew I had done that quite a bit myself before becoming a monk, you know, when I was in my first marriage, the end of my, around the end of my first marriage. So then I did stay there for a while. And then, then actually, luckily, I realized at some point in that process that I, in order to get them to listen to what I was trying to share with them, I would have to get stoned again. So they would think I wasn't just a monk because of having had a bad trip or something. <laughs> so I did. And I had to say that it had such a powerful if the experience of it based on some Buddhist practice was 10 times what it had been before, or no, well, it's always infinite, I guess I have to say so. But it was really great, actually. It was very, very helpful, it deepened stuff enormously. And, um, but I still also tried to get them to, to you know, stop, not, not conflict with the authorities, you know. And then I left there just when I had an intuition that there was something going to go wrong. And they, they have, in the, in the myth of Millbrook, they have me warning them that um, yeah, Gordon Liddy was about to attack them. And actually, a few days after I left, he did. <laughs> yeah. It was really weird. But I, I don't know why I had that intuition, but I did. And uh, so I had a, a nice time there. And then uh, Nina, who had been already a couple of years, a year, over a year separated and trying to get a divorce from Tim and had gone through the divorce, Tim was refusing to sign the final papers. So she came up to Millbrook a couple of times to try to get him to sign the papers. And then she had a little bit of a trip and um, you know, she was back in New York modeling and so on. And then we met and then I, I decided I had a vision or something and I decided to quit being a monk that I, that I wasn't able to really do what it was karmically I was supposed to do as a monk. And that was a very fraught for me because in Tibetan way, you take that vow for life and I didn't want Dalai Lama and my other Tibetan teachers to be mad at me, but I just felt that I had to do it. My old teacher in America had told me not to be a formal monk because I had a different karma and I wouldn't listen like an idiot. So then when I did realize what he meant, I, and I gave up being a monk, I, uh, I uh, left Millbrook at that time. And then my, my, that old teacher of mine said, well, I told you not to be a monk, so it's okay. 
and then he wouldn't take me back or wouldn't take me anywhere else. He brought me back to Millbrook, actually. He was clairvoyant, that guy. And then I met Nina as an ex-monk. And then that was, then, then, was a, then we had a history, you know. Well, I dropped before. She doesn't take responsibility for me doing that. Oh, okay. I had just dropped it, actually, about a, like a week before that time. But, and then I left Millbrook because I, they weren't listening to me and I was afraid they, was, they, they were going to get in more trouble. And, um, and then I met, though. Then I was open, open-minded. And, but it was, the way I met her was also very... Very interesting, and you know, I'll save that for a later date. But uh, I had an amazing meeting with her anyway. And then Tim finally relented after some con- little bit of confrontation, not too much. And he actually said something that was funny, turned out to be right. He said, I wonder when we did get together, start to get together, which was not, we had some ups and downs at first. But of course, the ex monk and the ex model, everybody on both sides thought we were nuts, you know. And um, Tim said, oh, I wondered when those two Tibetan refugees were going to get together. <laughs> he said, I thought that was, but other than he was a little bit begrudging because, of course, he wasn't really wanting to let go of her. Um, you know, it was a little bit rumpelstiltskin, you know, and uh, getting out of the tower type of thing. So anyway, right. it was kind of fun, you know. You know, because of the illegality and the, and the, the difficulty of the culture accepting the energy explosion of the 60s, which was very, very necessary in, the, in our evolution beyond our problems of racism and colonialism and blah, blah, blah. You know, and it was really huge. But then there's that whole faction, which we see now in glorious, you know, reality TV in front of us <laughs> at the moment uh, of the culture accepting. So because of that and because of its, uh, then the illegality done by Nixon and so on, um, you know, uh, everyone sort of had to go underground, you know, for 20, 30 years, which is too bad because the psychedelics are incredibly valuable door opener because they temporarily suspend the conceptual conditioning framework within which we imprison all of our experience and, and, and don't really touch the deeper level of reality that we that would really satisfy us in our life. But because, and because we're always fitting everything that happens to us into some preconceived idea. And so we have a, you know, we just follow some sort of habitual conditioned path. And we basically feel resentful about that. And we have irritated and so forth. And life, life is unrewarding. And meanwhile, we're greedy and angry and et cetera. So it's a really wonderful and useful thing. And all indigenous cultures use these things. And, uh, and it was a huge breakthrough from Hoffman and then from Tim and Richard and all these people. And, um, um, uh, but on the other hand, then if people then just get used to it and they want to stay that way, then it has turned out to be something difficult to handle. So it was very good that uh, initially, at the time when it was introduced, it was not illegal. It was experimental. A lot of psychiatrists were using it therapeutically. They were investigating it. And because it got so public and because of the st- social stress in the Vietnam War and the protest, the whole thing, it got shoved under, you know. And now I think it's coming back to where it can be really well used. And possibly, you know, like Ramdas, for example, was a total veteran of psychedelic adventuring or psychonauting, let's call it, psychonautical adventures. And um, a lot, you know, he learned a lot from Maharaji, opened his heart with that. But on the other hand, he wouldn't have been able to meet Maharaji that way if he hadn't had a huge heart opening and brain opening by the, his tremendous amount of psychedelic adventure. Well, well, but then, they, then nobody would give it credit, you know, for a long time right. because it was illegal, you know, so it had, so it was like, oh no, we're not this for that anymore. We just meditate, ram, ram, you know, or money pay me whom. And that was necessary and good for a long period of time. But now it may be that it's coming, you know, since uh, Michael Pollan wrote his wonderful book, it's getting to kind of coming out of the closet and it's coming into a, a sensible use now, you know, positive. I, I believe even the army generals, they really want it to be usable therapeutically in the VA system for their PTSD people 
because it's by far the best thing for that, for example. And since everybody who grows up in the nuclear industrial family in the late, late era of polluting industrialization, uh, which we're having to stop now and transform into something cleaner, uh, then, um, you know, this is, becomes necessary. Everybody has some kind of PTSD about it. But then in my long, um, what shall I call it, uh, ordeal of um, getting into, a, getting a PhD, you know, having a livelihood as a penniless ex-monk with an ex-model who hadn't exactly invested all of her, well, she was a supermodel, but she supported all artists and friends and very generous, open-hearted, so... And, and even gave money to Philbrook. So we were both a bit broke and we had to, I had to make a living. And so then I had to go back into the university system and this and that, taught for 50 years, got a PhD and taught for 50 years. And during that time, I didn't really have time to do it, A, B, didn't really have any. <laughs> so, you know, wasn't really able to do that. But uh, luckily, had, a, had some meditative practice that kept me still open, let's say, and kept me doing like that. And I haven't really had to, now I'm retired and you know, I'm very open to doing it. If, if there was a Burning Man, I wouldn't mind. In fact, I don't think I could go there if I wouldn't be a little bit, a little bit lubricated in my brain. But um, you know, it's too dusty for me, <laughs> I, I believe, too hot and dusty. But, um, so I, I hope to use it again in some way, but in other, although I don't officially do it, and uh, I'm kind of cool about it, but I'm, I'm gonna write an autobio myself. I'm, I'm sort of have one that I just, I'll pull together in the next year or two. I, I better, or I might croak, you know. In Tibetan way, actually, if Tibetans count a year ahead, so I'm actually 80 in Tibetan way, you know. I never in my life touched a, an, even an ounce of any opiate and except painkiller in the dentist's office. And I, 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 somebody once gave me a sniff of cocaine and I thought I was back in the dentist's office. It did not give me a buzz at all. And um, so those stimulants, either uppers or downers, you know, are really very, they are intoxicating, you know, whereas the psychedelics are far from intoxicating because what they do is they open you into a direct non-conceptual contact with reality. And uh, which is how, what starts with the hallucination and so on, as the Book of the Dead properly, anciently describes. And uh, they are deep learning. They are learning, uh, you know, and theogenics, as Houston Smith called them. And they help you get a deeper grip on your inner working and, your, and the world around you. And um, cultures that are more peaceful and where people are more cheerful, they use them for vision quests. Um, for people and um, our, our, our authoritarian Western European society, uh, Euro-American societies have never really easily explored this level, just like we had very few mystics. You know, we often killed our mystics, actually. You know, the Muslim, the Abrahamic religious groups often persecuted those who had some sort of direct experience of the divine and of nature and so on. And so that kind of thing was suppressed in our culture until recently. And, and that's made us more uneasy and we conquered everybody else because we were more unhappy looking for some, something by conquering somebody, which never does really make you happy. So, I mean, you get something physical out of it, but you don't really, you get more uptight yourself. So, uh, you know, the masters gets uptight by having to have the slave, you know. So, um, so that's the thing. It's uh, uh, I don't consider it's it's it, they can't they can't be addictive because they reveal to someone very powerfully more reality about themselves and about the world, and some aspect of that can be scary, etc. And people only the only the nicest people like to have themselves revealed to themselves, you know. So it's a very powerful thing, and it you should be used therapeutically and educationally. Uh, in a sane, sane, non-violent, happy, non-polluting, non-destructive society. And hopefully we have to get to a society like that on this whole planet. We, the colonialists, and though they, the formerly colonialized, we have to get there and we have to do it PDQ. Or we're all pretty much fried. You know? um, the reason I am optimistic, which um, is that... Um, I think I have finally come to understand a little more about what the role of the Buddha is in the world and uh, the sort of power of the Buddha, you know. 
And um, this is revealed in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is what, what I was so lucky someone commissioned me to retranslate it or translate it actually. There were, there's, there were existing some Indian translate, some translations from the Chinese, but, uh, there, and there was, but there was no translation from Tibetan. And the, at the time they did it, the Sanskrit was not available. It has become available since then and has uh, a version of the Sanskrit. And um, in that sutra, it shows that this world is not a Kali Yuga because of the Shakyamuni's visit to it. And yeah. he underneath the surface of it, and the surface, it looks like a Kali Yuga getting worse and worse. But on the deeper level, it is being, the beings are being ripened to come to that Shangri-La kind of Shambhala kind of future. And um, this is then elaborated very much in the Kala Chakra Tantra, you know, and that's where it's really more deeply elaborated. But um, so that gives me real hope. And then on a visceral level, on a sort of, let's say, historical level, on a vis in spite of all the horrible holocausts and wars and genocides and crap that's going on, even Tibet is still under kind of genocide, for example, which I'm in the Tibet house and everything, we're working to try to preserve the culture and to see to it that Tibet can be reborn uh, at some stage, you know. And um, so at a visceral level, maybe I should tell you one experience I had, which was actually not psychedelic in uh, there, there was no substance involved because I was in India in 1971, I didn't have anything, <laughs> uh, you know, and I don't consider pot to be that, to me it was never that psychedelic, it was just relaxing, and uh, hash or pot, you know, and I didn't have anything with me at the time. But um, it was right um, before Kissinger went to China, 1971, and people, Nixon had locked up a bunch of people in Washington DC in the Redskin um, Stadium, the protesters of the Vietnam War, <clears throat> Yeah, and, I was there. Uh, Allen Ginsberg came to India, Ronnie Lang, and these people. And it was a very apocalyptic time. And I had just been initiated into something called Hayagriva Mandala, which is a fierce form of this Avalokiteshvara. It's a thousand armed, thousand eyed, eleven headed um, incarnation of the compassion of all enlightened beings. And um, uh, I had this dream on the night of that initiation, which was such a weird dream, it was really cool though, where I was flying in the sky with Hayagriva. I was like on his back, and which was, I don't know, I, I, he was transparent in a way because I was seeing the world through him. And um, Brezhnev was about to nuke China and Nixon was abetting him to do so. And, and um, he actually pressed a bunch of buttons to nuke Mao. He hated Mao. They were having a war between China and Russia on the north of China. This is time of summer of 71. And Hayagriva was not going to have it, I noticed. <laughs> and he kept pressing the button. And Hayagriva has this flame, supernova flame hair. You know, like a more powerful than nuclear fission or hydrogen bomb, but like hydrogen fusion air. And Hayagriva, and I could feel it because I was on his back. And he, I was baffled, I, you know, why I was there. It was a dream, you know, really was a dream. And he took his hair and he jammed it down into all the electric circuitry of the nuclear weapon machinery from the Kremlin to the silos or whatever it was. And this hair went into all of it. And then I was somehow able to understand Russian. And Tim Leary was in Switzerland, by the way, at the time. And his presence there was really part of the dream. I don't know why. He was somehow moderating or monitoring. Uh, I don't know what he was doing. The connection, the red phone connection between Nixon and Brezhnev. And he was involved in stopping something about that. I don't know what it was. I know he was running away from Eldridge Cleaver, I think, actually. Yeah, he was running away from Algeria. Yeah, he was running away from Algeria. And he just went whack like this with his hair. And, the, and then the Russians were saying, well, we're sorry, sir. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with anything, but we're not getting the signal. You know, we're turning the key, we get the signal from you, and, you know, whatever football the Russians had. But it's not happening. And the, Brezhnev was not happening. And then I remember seeing Brezhnev kind of going like this, and it looked like he was masturbating, actually. 
Good. And then suddenly, then this went on for some time, but they couldn't understand. And he was, call was going to Nixon and with the CIA interfering and then no, and all this kind of thing. And uh, it just won't fly, you know, the missiles. And, um, and, then, um, and then I remember during the, in the dream, my old Mongolian teacher who said to me once during some, one of those kind of conversations people get into where it's all going down the drain and maybe we'll have nuclear war now, I, you know, much, a few years earlier. And he made this thing like, no way, well, I'll guarantee we'll never have that. And he would occasionally make statements like that that were like prophetic, you know, and you never forgot them, you know. And I somehow remember that in the dream. And uh, then at one point, both Nixon and Brezhnev looked up and I don't know what they, and they looked at me rather at Hagagriva, and I don't know what they saw. Maybe they saw some sort of archangel in their unconscious. I have no idea. But they totally looked subdued and they totally dropped it. And they decided to really give it up. And then it was a very wonderful feeling, you know. It was really great seeing sort of mind and love and this fierce compassion block electronic signals that would have killed millions of people. There's one thing that then, to the very end, I sort of look sideways from where I was in the Himalayas, you know, in, in, uh, in a place called Almora. No, Dalhousie. I was in Dalhousie. And this sort of Dalai Lama was meditating over in the corner looking, I don't know, he, he didn't know, I mean, he wasn't involved in it, but he was sitting there. I didn't receive this initiation from him, from someone else, and from his, one of his teachers. And then, for, to my amazement, I saw the face of Joe N. Lai. <laughs> And Joe and Lai was also seeing Hayagriva and the Dalai Lama, and he was laughing. <laughs> and he was saying, ha, ha, ha. You see, why, why you even try to deal with us? You can't even hurt your enemies. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a dream, it was, but it was a vivid dream. It was like a trip, you know, but it wasn't a trip. I, actually, it was no... No benevolent chemicals were involved, except from in my own, bo own body, you know. But like, did you, it, was magic. Did you, it was totally magic. It was magic. So did here, you, feel there was, uh, you know, if the, there is a narrative okay. from Shakyamuni's time to now, where all these male chauvinist, patriarchal, violent cultures, which have been having wars on and off, tribal and everything, for about 5,000 years, without maybe, maybe 10,000. If you listen to Maria Jimbutas, maybe 10,000 years and the last eight, 10,000 years. And we now have reached this point where war and violence just doesn't cut it. And the, 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 the domineering, nasty husbands, you know, the ones who just have the 10th trophy wife and all this kind of thing, um, you know, with their money and their power and everything, they can't control the force of love and they are too miserable and they're just lashing around and they want to have another world war. If this was a usual pattern, we'd be having another one by now already. So all those dictators would be able to confuse their people even more about some other enemy because they only rule by fear, which we're seeing just now in this day, in the evening, the, the, the try to attempt to promote fear to keep in power, you know? And they're losing it. And they are just ridiculous, you know? It's like, it is a, it's an unreality show, not a reality show. And we're coming to the brink of a time when we're going to make it work. We're going to cool the planet. We're going to not have a war. We're going to have a real democracies everywhere. The authoritarian weirdo creeps are showing their irrelevance. And um, it's going to happen. But it is, it, you know, and, and one, of the, one of the big factors is that the, the, the Euro-American very warlike, almost like titanic type of cultures that are based on violence and patriarchality. Uh, they have reached a point of self, you know, like self implosion, where their own skill at violence is rebounded back against themselves and they can't use it anymore. So they have to now come to gentleness and they have to come to self-understanding and they have to surrender to nature, you could say, and realize of their interconnectedness to nature. You know, the scientists reached it in 1926 at the Copenhagen time when they realized they couldn't control the subatomic particles or, and there was energies there that they couldn't even cope with. And even today, they still are trying to run away from that 
what they have talked about dark energy is 97% of it holding their rickety model together. It's not Buddhism, but in the heart of every being, there is this, what, what we call, what you could call a Buddha nature, or you could call it a, a soul, a soul of love and compassion and wisdom, which is the direct thing that experiences the world. And even the most evil person has that thing. And what makes them evil is that it's inaccessible to them. They get wrapped around it in these coils of, 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 of frustration and, and, and misery, and therefore they want to inflict that, and, and they're desperately grabbing at others in a, in a violent way, which makes it worse instead of better. And, um, but they all have in their own heart this other thing. And, you know, the cure for some of them who are really bad is death. When they go through death, like in the near-death experience, they go straight into the white tunnel, you know, and then they finally get to relax. And then they get born somewhere, and then unfortunately they may get born in a bad place. The thing is, though, that uh, we are getting there. There has been some improvement, you know. Like, uh, like my wife, for example, even all I've been through, she has still not accepted me as her disciple. I'm still a novitiate. And, but she says, I have shown some improvement from my male chauvinist wasp upbringing, you know, by the help of Dalai Lamas and Mongolians and everything. But I'm still not fully accepted because I still interrupt. You know, I think I'm finishing her thought, but actually I'm interrupting it and not getting the full benefit of it. Still, I still have the habit. So it's not easy, you know. And, um, but we're getting there. And in a way, I think, you know, I, I am haunted by Edgar Casey at the moment. Totally. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but you know what? Did you know what he said? He lived in Virginia Beach, you know. Yeah. And he said that when someday there's going to be a black man who's going to be the president of the United States, and that will be the end of the United States, he said. And he wasn't a racist himself at all. He was, he was, he was being, you know, realistic in what he thought in terms of the way his people were around him. And, uh, and so we're seeing, I think, in a way, it is that we're at the end of it. You know, it's, we have a, we are led by someone who is aligned with every enemy of the United States, the United States, the American Revolution that we've ever had, starting with the British colonialists, the East India Company, the, the Civil War, the, the, the rebels, you know, the Nazis, the Russians. He's every enemy we ever had. He is a, an agent of them, and he's ruling us, showing how self-destructive we, beca we became. I mean, as, as a collective. And so I think that it's the end, so we have to start anew. And I think we will, you know. But I, I do worry, so don't, it's not that I'm that, but I, the reason I mentioned the dream is I know it's completely crazy and it's just a dream. And it looks like we are at the end. And you know, the, there's nothing gonna happen. You know, the Paris Accord, I mean, you know, forget about it. But. I did go, the minute I retired last summer, I went to uh, Al Gore's Climate Reality Project training in Minneapolis. And um, I got that training and then I've been looking into it and I follow all of these things and we have absolutely, we can easily defeat the oil and fossil fuel industry and the militarists and everything and have a decent planet. And it's in their interest to actually do it. And they are actually, they don't even want to go and drill in the Arctic. You know, they don't want to have Trump's idiot uh, people uh, undoing the EPA and everything. They don't even want it now. They realize their days are <laughs> numbered, you know. Okay. That was not really a debate, you understand. It was promoted, not even by the, that much by Stephen. It was promoted as, as if it was a big debate. But the debate began when Stephen said, well, he didn't really think there wasn't a future life. He just didn't know. Right. So that was like conceding the debate ahead of time. You know, in other words, they tried to put it like he's against the former future life, which is sort of a, an American immature Zen view. And I think the mature, more mature Zen view, they've gotten past that quite a bit. Not everyone, but quite a few of them. And, um, and I'm I, was I am representing the view that the former future life and the continuity of life and that we've all lived many, many lifetimes beginninglessly, and we will continue living them endlessly. And the, the default position is that. That's the common sense position. The completely abstruse and insane position is that, that any energy continuum could ever be nothing. 
That's true. People, if they're going to say that, they have to prove that because nobody's ever witnessed it. And they've never experienced that. Nobody ever experienced nothing. And they never will, actually, by the meaning of the word, you know, because there's no such thing. It's the point. To, to think that, well, nothing disappears because nothing isn't there. Exactly. <laughs> but no, something disappears. In other words, that's the conservation of energy. Then they go, oh, yeah, but we have entropy. Well, so that can take a while, entropy. But it's still, the energy is still there. So the point is, every single materialist who argues that they're going to be nothing when they die, which means that essentially there are nothing right now, they have no soul, and they did that to escape from the Inquisition, and I applaud them for doing so. But still, anybody who argues that is going on a blind faith in something that nobody has experienced, because there's no experience of nothing. It's ridiculous to say there could be, you see, and they, they have that when they talk of energy. And so the point is that that is the way the relative universe obviously works. But if anybody wants to make it be some other way, then they should have to prove that. So that's, that came to me only, I would say, 10 years ago. I finally, because I had so many arguments with different natural science types and social scientists who are trying to be natural scientists and then humanities philosophers who want to be handmaidens of natural scientists because they're the high priests of the secularist, um, you know, troops, division. So, what I never I denies the existence of the relational soul. Of the, and if you define it as the super subtle, something like a DNA molecule, but this is a non-material pattern that is that transmits that constantly changes and go and you can be a dinosaur and an animal and a crocodile right after you die if you insist on it and and in other words you will not remember being phil and i won't remember being bob we would be whatever we are and we can go from other planets so there's a continuum of super subtle energy i call it like a spiritual or a mental dna and that's the obvious thing. That's what's in the Buddhist science. That's what the Buddhist science argues. Although the Buddhist science does say this. It says that reality, whatever it is, when you say absolute, you mean really ulti you know, actual, the real reality, not the illusory one, so, which is this one, but the, the actual one. In reality, no theory can ever capture what's going on. So in a way, even the karma, you know, which means simply causation of relativity, even karma is any particular description of it is more or less valid within a particular context, but it's never an absolute dogma, if you follow me. The, the, you know, it's karma is a relational law, but not an absolute law. So there's no absolute dogma. If anybody can discover nothing, if they can, the American Physics, Physicists Association, if they can come up with a foolproof proof of that, they, that nothing exists, they're welcome to it. And we would really go for that. You know, it's like Carl Sagan once asked the Dalai Lama, we have it on videotape. He said, Your Holiness, what would you do if we made a foolproof experiment with every angle covered and we proved empirically beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no reincarnation? What would you do? Dalai Lama looked thoughtful for a moment. He said, well, I stopped believing in it. He said, and Sagan, Sagan was like, huh? <laughs> How, what? Yeah, I said, if, if the evidence is there, I'll stop believing in it. I said, of course. Well, well that's been of course, a great then, deal then, of then, then there was a couple of beats. And yeah. then Dalai Lama speaks to Sagan. He says, how are we going to go about setting up that experiment? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Sagan, uh, duh, you know. So it took me 15 years of, of being aware of that little exchange to realize that the main argument is we don't have to prove reincarnation or rebirth, whatever you want to call it. You get anybody who wants to say that anything can be nothing has to prove that. Because in fact, that's impossible to prove because you will never experience that. There is even a meditative experience that seems like nothing that the Buddha even said you can achieve it was one of the things one of his teachers when he was right out of the gate before he went for his six years of, of asceticism. One of them was he reached a kind of what they thought of was nothing the state. And he realized Buddha immediately realized that's not a nothingness. That's a state projecting my idea of nothing into a state. But it's not nothing because I got in it and I'm getting out of it. And I did and I came back out of it. So it's definitely not nothing. So, so anyway, that's that. But my point there is, therefore, 
uh, we all are dying and living and we have been for thousands of years and we will continue to be. And eventually we decide it's too boring to live so selfishly and harmfully and violently. And we wise up and we'll like let the women take the lead and we'll be happy and we will fix the planet. You see, that's the thing, you know, Shunyata Karuna Garbham. Yeah, I know you like the Dharma film. Shunyata Karuna Garbham. You know, voidness, the womb of compassion. It's Nagarjuna's favorite statement, and it's a huge statement all over all the tantras, especially Kala Chakra. And it means that when you reach emptiness by realization, by analytically using critical reason, you analytically demolish all conceptual structures, which one acid trip won't enable you to, but it will open the door to the process for sure. And you use critical reason, however, you need to use your concepts to do it. You can't just do it by temporarily falling out of your concepts because the concepts will reassert themselves. The patterns are so deeply ingrained. It, they reach the instinctual level. But when you do that, and then you come out into like an open space and there's a trap there, because some people do that and they think, oh, that's emptiness. And I'll go back there later. And they, they, they create, imagine an absolute that's outside of relativity. But when you do it really completely, the momentum of the analysis, of the penetration, of the critical prajna, you know, wisdom, makes you realize, well, this, em this space is also, what is it? And the, the disappeared state disappears. And the nothingness state, the emptiness, and the emptiness state, they were sort of slightly different. They both disappear, and then the relativity is there. Because relativity is the emptiness, you see. The emptiness is the relativity. It doesn't underlie it, or be outside of it, or something, you know. It is all of these things, you know. And that's why it says emptiness equals relativity, I'm saying, you know. And it's a more thorough relativity than Einstein's, because Einstein made the speed of light an absolute because that's kind of a barrier for matter. Because when it goes faster than, when a particle goes at that speed, it, the mass, its mass becomes infinite and therefore it, it's meaningless to be a particle because it already is everywhere or something like that. So he kind of hit the clear light there, but he thought that was a boundary of a material universe because he was, he was forced to consider the universe was material only. Mind can go beyond speed of light to instant, in, instantaneous transcendence of distance and time is not issue for mind exactly. but the matter cannot you know and we, we are, uh, so, we are so he was up to it but he was he re-absolutized the boundary of the relativity that he found through his thought through his meditations which were thought experiments really is how he found it but he he absolutized the kind of boundary state and there is a danger for those great yogis and yoginis who reach them to that they will reach a boundary state like that and then they'll absolutize that and think that nirvana is here. Then when they come out of it and they, they'll run around for a few years and think they'll go back there. And that's what we call dualistic Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism, you know, where they project nirvana as out, off planet, if you will. Well, and, you, uh, you've, never, you've never taken rationality and exploration off the table. It's been the principal no, aspect of your no, argument. No, there's not a, no, rationality. Exploration, rationality, exploration, exploration takes yeah. you right to the exactly. mirror surface. It takes you to the mirror surface, but it doesn't control what's in the mirror. Correct. It's, but you don't have to leap from some other place to hit the mirror surface. The rationality, that's, you know, the first title, the first title of that book that, that you have there, the original title of it was called Speech of Gold, yep. Reason and Enlightenment in the, something in the, in the philosophy of Central Philosophy of Tibet, something like that. And um, so, it, you know, it's that reason, the critical, you know, like in Zen, the koan or the, you know, in the Rinzai and in the, and in the Soto, the koan of being sitting on a pillow when you feel like shit and you're told you're a Buddha, which is a super koan. You know, and, and that koan brings your critical reason into conflict, showing the, the, the contradictions in your conceptualities and pushing them against each other until there's like an explosion. And that's what the Satori is. But without using the reason to generate that super doubt, like a mountain of doubt on top of your head, you are not gonna, you're not going to break to Satori, just throwing away your thinking. So that's, that's a wrong way to teach Zen. In other words, just to stop thinking. You know, if you just stop thinking, you can get a buzz because you, it takes a lot of energy to have your brain think. 
but that but your confusions come back when you when you stop doing it you know but but when you realize emptiness you're free and you can't go back This episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast was originally streamed online live September 2020 as a part of the Meditation and Psychedelics interview series. To watch the full video version, please visit the YouTube link in the podcast description. The Bob Thurman Podcast is produced under a Creative Commons No Derivatives License. Please be sure to share like, and repost on your favorite social media platforms. Interstitial music for the Bob Thurman podcast is generously supplied by Tenzing Chogyal. To learn more about the work and music of Tenzing Chogyal, please visit his website. This podcast is brought to you in part with a generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and listeners like you. To learn how to support this podcast by becoming a member, please visit our websites at thus.org, menla.org, and bobthurman.com. This is Justin Stone Diaz, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Tashi and hope to see you soon online or in person.